Only one participant? What? Oh, here they are. It's just that sometimes, like, I like likes to go and they donate to them. Just correct me if I'm wrong here. You said, quote, I know guys when they're lonely and when they don't have a good family situation, they're... Can everybody hear me? Yeah, what was that? I don't know. Zoom gets weird, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I must be the host. I'm surprised. I didn't think I was going to... How you that. doing? I'm good. Is it just me and you? No, we have six on. Chuck Orland, can you hear me? Chuck? I can hear you, Sean. I don't know why. Are you still there? Yeah. Now, now everybody blanked out. This, Zoom this should be interesting. Yeah, it could be interesting. <laughs> Where are you at? Are you still out of town? No, I'm I'm home. I'm leaving Wednesday. Okay. I don't know who. This is bizarre. Mari, can you hear us? I need you to check me out on 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 that new medium boat. So you're the only one that's got any. Chuck, do you have any any sound? Mark, I can hear you just fine. Alex, thank you. Now, I'm not really, I mean, the election committee is supposed to be the host, but we're kind of early. Would you bring your wife into the picture? I've never met her. I don't know, Carol. You, you know, want to see, you want to be on the Zoom call and say hi to everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay, she doesn't want to do it. <laughs> I tried. Uh, hi. There's, can you see her? Yeah. Hi. That's Carol. Hi. Right hi. on. I've always wanted to. Oh, I've always wanted to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you. I can't yeah, your see husband, you though. Your husband? Oh, you can't see me. Yeah, you're your all dark, speaks, Sean. Uh, oh, sorry. I have no light where I'm at. I'm in my van. Yeah. Video, video. We need. We need everybody's video. Yeah, you're I'm all dark. <laughs> I can see the shine, the light on your glasses. That's about yeah. it. Oh, that's it. <laughs> you're you're coming in nice and clear. He's in the dark. But anyway, nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, nice to meet you. Hey, Marlo, good to see you. Sorry you can't hey, see Sean. me. Ugh. It's okay. I can see your glasses. Maybe. Well, oh, I can kind of see you. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah I'm it's... holding my iPad up to my face. Yeah. That's okay. As long as you can hear the meeting and everything. Yeah, this might be interesting. Yeah, we'll still, see. Yeah. We're still a little I'm kind early. of wondering, wondering, uh, I guess um, Paula is not going to be the club secretary anymore. She's going to be um, going for something else, but I'm not sure exactly why. They, I guess something in the bylaws? No, no. <clears throat> Used to be able to hold two offices, but not anymore. She's not running for two offices. She's going to run for um, membership chair in the marina. Oh, not not secretary membership chair okay yeah when janet um susan anderson uh withdrew she decided to run in her place does the membership oh, does the membership oh never mind so janet you're, guess... you're from the election committee is, is yes. um but jason's the one that's hosting this tonight yes i hope he, i don't know how come i'm on host i logged in and it looks it says i'm host <laughs> Which is crazy. Oh. I didn't think I was hosting, but I don't see Jason on there yet. Not yet, but we've got okay. five. I just did it early to say hi to him. Yeah. 
I mean, how early are we? Like a couple of minutes? Not much now. No. Four or five minutes. Yeah, no, seven twenty-six. I mean, most people come on right right at on time. Yeah, I mean, I plan on being very silent here. Just I'm kind of as a you know observer. I'm not going to really do much other than be an observer and maybe well, interject. Have something. we have we ever done this before? Yeah, I, we have. Oh, I don't I'm, know. Not not since I've been a member, which is about two and two to three years. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times we don't have people running, you know, more than one person running for an office. You know, right. now we only have two, you know, con contested offices. So, but over the years we've had candidate forums. You know, m more in. probably more probably Glasses. in the non digital <laughs> age, but we've done it. So who who Hi, is it? Susan? Howdy. Hi. Howdy. Hey, Susan. So do we have How many people? Yet? How many people got? One. 15 so far. Okay. Susan's on. That's good. But but do we have do we have um Jason on yet? No, not yet. <laughs> Please. Now there's a co-host here. Um who's the co-host? Is it me? <laughs> no, I, I saw your name. If, if I am, I did know what I was. think that whoever is the ho the main host can um can change it so that you can make anyone your co-host if yes, you want. Yes, you can. But you can. And you can actually turn it over to them. Connecting to yeah, audio. Which is what I would like to do. But I don't see who the, it doesn't. There you know what? I, I've never met Jason. So I, I, I uh, we've only been emailing for over a year. So I don't know what he looks like. So you have to tell me if he gets on. Well, here, Berwin, who, who's this here? Hello? Hello? That's Bruce, Hi. Gail. That's Bruce. Bruce. We're looking for Jason. Did Jason- Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Janet. Oh, good. You have to make yourself host, apparently. Yeah, I logged in and I became host and I wasn't planning on being the host. Well, All right, I think, I think I am the host now. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. There. I see you went. Okay. Good. You're the host. Awesome. Okay. So, do you then, want every? Do you want everyone to mute? Yeah. So, um, we can give everybody a couple minutes, but uh, yeah, we'll mute everybody other than the participants in the debate and uh, the election committee. And hey, bye, guys. Jason, I'm gonna mute myself. What debate, Jason? Are you gonna tape this? Because somebody asked about taping it. Yeah, I believe we're recording. Right? Did I see someone okay. start the recording? Yes, it, it well, it, I see record with a red light on it, but I, I'm glad. No crap, no, I crap. It's a meeting? Uh -huh. Hey, Art. <laughs> hey, Art. You meet yourself. Jason, Jason, yes, how do we uh, submit questions? So for questions, if you go um, on the bottom in the chat, just uh, send them to everyone, and then that's where we'll pick the questions from. Thank you. There's also a Q and A tab um, at the t if you just tap on your screen next to the Zoom um, icon, it says Q and A. I don't know if that's anything. Yeah, if you go to uh, if you're on your computer, if you go to More and then Q and A, let's let's do that. So whoever just asked the question, instead of using the chat type the three little ellipses for more. And then there, there's an option for Q and A, and then that'll get you like a ticketing system where we can keep track of each question individually, which I think will be more fruitful here. Well, you really... Okay, but wait, Jason, if you're not on, if you're on an iPad, you don't have that three three dots. Yeah, where did you say the iPad one was at? I, I don't um, see what... that. When I, when I check my, tell, I'm on my cell phone. So when I just tap the screen, um, there's a few things that comes up. Like at the top, it'll say, leave the Zoom call. Q&A, I see that, it. it's a Q &A. Mm -hmm. Very good, got it. 
Okay. And Our, if, I think your computer is sideways. Uh, not that it matters. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> just, just so you know that you are sideways. <laughs> and if you have any, uh, if anybody has any trouble with, with the Q and a thing, just put them in the chat and we can, we can pick them up there too. So no, no problems. Um, but we'll get, I'll get going on the spiel. So my name's Jason King. I'm the chair of the election committee, uh, along with Phoebe Yu and Janet Geiler this year. Um, we appreciate everybody joining and everybody's time. Uh, what we have is we have um, two sessions that we're going to run back to back as part of one whole candidate forum. The first one is going to be for uh, Commodore, and then it's going to be for Marina Del Rey membership secretary. So the first two uh, participants are going to be Lennox and Steven, and then it's going to be Paula and Bruce for the second one. The election committee is going to moderate the discussion, meaning we'll present the questions uh, to the candidates. We'd ask for everybody to be muted and don't, uh, you know, come off mute unless something catastrophic is happening. Uh, any questions you have, put them in the Q and A box, which you can find on the bottom of the bar if you're on your computer, or next to the Zoom logo if you're on your uh, phone or iPad. And if you have any problems with that, just put it in the chat and we'll we'll process it that way. Um, what else do we got? We'll select questions. Please try to keep your questions relevant to both parties. If it's a question only pertaining to one candidate, you know, not really the the subject that we're looking for here. We're supposed to be finding out, you know, candidates positions on issues that are common to them. So, you know, please ask relevant questions for both uh, of the candidates that are going to be in front of you. And each session is going to last an hour. So we'll have an hour for Lennox and Steven and then an hour for Paula and Bruce. Uh, despite the Marina Del Rey membership secretary seemingly pertaining only to Marina Del Rey, we would want to remind everybody that every member on the executive board has input um, on issues before the club. So even if you're a Channel Islands Harbor member, you still have an interest in, in the Marina Del Rey membership secretary because they will have an impact uh, on your club. So feel free to stick around for both of those. And we would encourage everybody to uh, participate in both, uh, both candidate discussions. Uh, for each hour, we're going to have five minute opening statement for each candidate and then 45 minutes of Q&A. Uh, each candidate's going to get a minute and 30 initial response, two minutes for the other candidate to respond and then 30 minutes for the first candidate to uh, reply back. And then we'll switch off whoever goes first. And then we'll have a short closing uh, statement at the end. And candidates and everybody else, you know, this isn't necessarily a debate where we get to go back and forth. So if it's your minute and 30 seconds or your two minutes, you know, the other candidate should remain silent until it's their uh, time to, to, to speak and, and, and their time to take. So Assuming nobody has any questions, uh, we'll go ahead and kick it off. So Lennox, with our coin, you're going to be heads. Steven, you're going to be tails. We'll flip it, and it comes up heads. So Lennox, we'll put you on the clock, assuming you're ready to go for a five-minute opening statement. Five minutes, wow. Well, um, thank you for creating this forum. I I've asked several people whose idea this was, um, election committee or board or someone else, but I, I still don't know who it is. I think it's a good idea. Um, I, I've always been, I've always been of the opinion that the candidate statement should be the limit uh, for, you know, a sailing club like ours that should be focused on sailing and sailing education and community outreach. I think the candidate statement should be enough, um, but I do think this is a, probably a good idea. I hope I think the same way an hour or two from now about it. Um, I think it. I think maybe in the future, if this you know becomes a regular thing, and uh, maybe even the candidate statements are emailed rather than having to try to find them on the website, that would probably be good. Um, I think it also uh, will, uh, it, it might mitigate some, I think, election regularities that I think have happened over the past two or three or four elections. So, so I'm, you know, interested and um, hope my interaction with you tonight is productive. Oh, I guess I guess I should say too, if I have five minutes. Um, 
I've uh, uh, I've held a, I've held a number of positions at Fairwind. Um, I started out in 2010, you know, kind of unhappy with all of the hoops I had to jump through to get up through the boats. But after the first year, I decided, okay, I'll just I won't I won't work so much as a charter skipper at other clubs and get paid for it. I'll just volunteer here, instruct, and and get my time on boats that way. And that worked pretty well. And um, I guess uh, I did that for two or three years. And then around 2013, I was uh, asked by Marv Brown to uh, become a um, safety officer. Uh, I've renamed that since then to safety chair so that that person can actually form a committee because some of these safety incidents do require more than one person. So I was safety officer, safety chair for two years. And then uh, George Westerdahl cornered me into doing to being rear commodore and my office desk has never recovered from that mm -hmm. uh it, that began in 2015 and i did that for two years uh fenster is much 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 better a rear commodore than i ever was um uh up around 2017 then i uh became port captain i did that for five consecutive years and uh, the last three of those, I was also a Commodore. So I was in that dual position. Uh, membership voted, I think a year or two ago uh, where no one can actually run for two offices. I think people could still hold two offices if somebody were to uh, resign or something, but not, you can't run for two. So that's, you know, that's, that's probably, that cuts into my efficiency, but I think overall uh, it's good for the club. Um, if you get if you have a really good person there, I think it's not so good. But if you have somebody that maybe doesn't work out so well, it's good to uh, reelect somebody else. Um, what else? Since leaving office in twenty twenty two, I spent a lot of time in twenty twenty three um, uh, doing research into boat usage. Uh, there, there was a claim that uh, most of the boats were used for day sailing. And uh, I, I that was that sounded very odd to me. So I I did a, a research hour by hour granularity, and it turned out that uh, at 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 large boats there's a two to four times greater usage uh, for cruising than there is for day sailing, and uh, the medium boats break out about even cruising day sailing, and then the small boats of course are just day sailers because of the composition of the fleet. But the composition of that fleet could change, I think, to allow small boat people to cruise as well. And then uh, that was 2023. And then I guess beginning in April of this year, 2024, I was asked to join the um, bylaws and rules committee along with uh, chaired by Phil Barbaro and Alan McGovern and Bill Connor and Bruce Gale. Um, there's one more person in there I'm forgetting. Uh, and that has been productive, I think. So um, um, I, I, uh, I've, been, I've enjoyed that work so far, but we're only about half done, I would say, or maybe a third, a third done with reviewing all of the laws and rules. All right, you're coming up on your time. Your time. I'm, I'm done. I'm done for now. Okay. Thank all you. All right. Thanks, Lennox. Uh, Stephen, you're up. Did you unmute him? I'm working on it. Steven, you are unmuted, Steven. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> for putting this together. Good evening, Commodore. Good evening, members of the board. Good evening, members. I'm so glad to be here before you. I'm excited to be running for Commodore. I joined, I joined Fairwind in 2002. My wife and three children and I had recently completed a voyage aboard our Ocean 71 catch, Celestial. We lived and cruised aboard for three years. I was so grateful to find Fairwind when I came home. Uh, joining Fairwind was like coming home again. I was welcomed into a warm community of sailing loving friends, all of whom seemed to share a passion for boats and the sea. I've learned a great deal from Fairwind over the years. I've become a trainer and instructor at all levels. I helped to establish our second harbor delivering freedom to, to Channel Islands Harbor. I served as a boat chief for the first two years while helping to ramp up membership there. I also served as fleet surgeon 
and safety officer. I participated as a hearing officer on grievance panels. I've been a member or officer of two boat selection committees and chair of an ad hoc governance committee. I continue to volunteer as a skipper on cruises to Catalina and Santa Cruz Island. My firsthand experience with the complexities and intricacies of our club as it developed has taught me many lessons. There were 68 members when I joined. Now there are over 600. I'm grateful for Fairwind as it was then and as it is now. Some growing pains obviously are going to happen, but our fundamental values of democracy, our transparency of accountability have not changed. They continue to guide our efforts as individuals and as a club. Service and fun remain our core priorities. Sustaining openness and mutual respect for the dignity of the journey of each one of us continues to challenge us as our numbers and our diversity expand. Fairwind continues to be a wonderful club. My agenda for our future is to expand transparency, to increase the clarity of governance, and to implement bi-directional communication and due process. Although I've been asked to run for Commodore several times, I needed to decline due to work commitments. Now that I'm retired, I'm eager to dedicate myself to the club. My primary goal, if I'm elected as your Commodore, is to reignite the sense of camaraderie and connection that initially drew me to the club in 2002. It's my feeling that over the years, this sense of community has somewhat waned. And I think it's time to bring back the genuine collaborative fellowship that made Fairwind such a welcoming and inclusive organization. I'm excited by the opportunity to help to restore our club to the warmth and inclusive community that it once was. With your support, we can bring back that sense of togetherness. And my commitment to prioritize inclusion, transparency, and clarity and accountability in a club's operations sounds kind of abstract. So I, I, I wanna be very clear. I have very specific plans in mind to do that. Uh, one of the ways is I'm gonna reestablish open communication between members and officers. I will treat, achieve this in several different ways. Uh, none of them are gonna be imposed. All of them are gonna be consensual from the members, but I will allow members to attend board and Harbor committee meetings. I will ensure that meeting, meeting, excuse me, meeting minutes are comprehensive and are distributed promptly. I will enhance our security and data management procedures so as to prevent the mysterious loss of crucial meeting records and recordings. Our bylaws and standing rules were adequate when we had 68 members. Now we have over 600. And some documents, the same documents are just not sufficient. The proposed revisions presented by the current board and the rules committee will only further consolidate decision-making authority in the board and further ship control away from membership and to a very few people. You know, we say the board and we say the Harbor Committee, like we're talking about two different things. The board is the two Harbor Committees, plus the co Commodore and the Secretary and the Treasurer. And in our case, Marina Del Rey, uh, the Treasurer sits on the Harbor Committee. So it's the same thing. I believe we your, need a your time's broader, coming to a close, Stephen. Thank you. I think we need a broader base. I okay. I believe we develop we need to develop a decision making process that actively seeks and values timely input from all members, while also enabling us to adopt new policies in an efficient manner. Thank you for okay. your attention. I look forward to your questions. Okay, so we'll go to uh, a question from Daniel. What's your policy on the criteria for membership? And maybe we'll wrap that into what's your vision for the membership aspect of the club and, and how you see that growing or contracting or being controlled during your term. And uh, Lennox, go ahead and go first on that one. I'm sorry, I thought that was gonna be a, a Steve question. Uh, what is the what is the 
qualification for membership? Is that what it is? Yeah, and maybe more broadly, you know, what's your vision for for the membership growth or, or how you see that progressing during your term? Okay. Well, um, you know, ideally, um, Bruce, and I, I think actually I forgot to mention, I was also on the admissions committee for a while. Um, I, I think Bruce and I always like to see people come into Fairwind with uh, ASA 101, keelboat sailing, at least. And if they had 103 coastal cruising, that would be good. I think though, in reality, what happens is some people come in uh, with almost no sailing experience, especially if, if they have some other skill that's relevant to the club, like legal services or fiberglass repair or something like <laughs> that. Um, so it would be nice if they were experienced, but if they're not, you know, that's okay in some cases. I, I, I worry about, uh, since the club has this 320 member cap now, independent of how many boats we have, independent of the loading on each boat, which can be adjusted. Um, there will come a time very soon when uh, we're not gonna be able to admit any new members from the outside, from the community, uh, unless somebody inside the club uh, resigns or moves to a uh, leave of absence or boat ownership or honorary or passes away. So I don't know. I don't, uh, I don't know that uh, it's going to be as germane in the near future as to what our new members will be like, because I don't think there'll be as many. That's a minute 30 for you. Um, but like I said, that, the 101, 103, I think that's good. Um, I've, uh, when I, I was, a, I came in as a level two trainer, a level two instructor training and checkout. So um, we are equipped as Fairwind to bring people in that have never sailed before and to make them relatively safe uh, for themselves and their crew and their passengers and the boaters around them. It's your time okay, still do that. Okay, Stephen. That, that yes. Um, I think that one of the best ways to get members is to get members from existing members. People have friends who are not in the club who have an interest in sailing. I don't care if they don't sail. I do care that they're committed to learning. We're amazing at teaching people how to sail if they want to learn. Uh, I like to see people with sailing experience. I love to see people who know what happens below decks and in the compartments, in the bilges, with the pumps, with the wires, with the pipes, with the spars, with the rigging. We have people like that. We have not really fostered the volunteerism that we should be fostering. We haven't been teaching what some of us know in a way that is enrolling. I want to see more of that. We may be expanding to new harbors. It depends on whether members support it and based on a study and research, which I hope to uh, implement. I also think that um, existing members of existing harbors should have the privilege of, of identifying as members of other harbors. I definitely think, although it was very well-meaning to limit the size of the club, I think we haven't really identified and examined our fiscal issues. The club's lost money in two out of the last three years. This is a major problem. Uh, I'm not diverting from membership. Membership's very important. Membership is one of the ways we pay our bills. We may have shot ourselves in the foot by limiting membership, if we can keep the loading appropriate so that people do get a chance to have the fun they want to have, having more people may be a real advantage. Okay. Um, then we'll go back to you, Stephen, on the next question. Uh, and it kind of begs the question, I guess, but how will you reduce the number of meetings that a board member must attend? Currently, it's more than 20, and the Commodore has more than 40. 
I think those numbers are somewhat arbitrary. I think that, for example, we have board meetings and we have membership meetings and board members are supposed to be at both. So four meetings becomes eight meetings. Uh, we used to have board meetings at the same time we had membership meetings. I advocate for members to be present, to have the privilege of being present. I shouldn't say privilege because of the right to hear what the people they've chosen as officers and directors are doing and deliberating. They can't be disruptive. They can't hog the floor, but they have every right to hear what's going on while it's going on and who said what about what. So there four meetings or eight meetings become four. I could go on down the list. The way we do meetings is at the convenience of the board, basically. And um, that's hopefully going to be flexible. All right, Lennox. Okay, and what do I what do I do now? Uh, how will you reduce the number of board meetings that a member must attend? I don't think members are really required to attend any meeting, as far as I know, unless that's a new uh, stipulation. Um, the board is required to hold a membership meeting at least once per quarter. Um, they can do it more often if they want, and sometimes they do, especially if a boat is being um, purchased. Uh, when I was a uh, port captain, Commodore port captain, or just port captain, I hold monthly meetings every third Thursday of the month so that everybody always knew when the date was. Uh, and there was a time when I, I vaguely remember that there was an open and a closed part to each meeting, like a lot of, a, 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 I would say a lot, but quite a bit of what happens at a board meeting or at a membership meeting has to do with, um, you know, confidential matters. Um, and uh, that would probably still have to be closed, but I don't really know what happened to the open session. Uh, of the board that hasn't as far as I remember that hasn't been true I think at least since 2015 um I would I would be okay with bringing that back um I think the I think when it did happen the closed session happened first as I recall and then the open session followed but um I uh, I don't know that members are actually required to attend anything. I think they should. Sure. Um, we need, you know, getting a quorum of 10% of, uh, it's not 10% of all members, 10, just 10% 10 of, of regular, or maybe it is all members. I think it is, yeah. 10% of all members has been a problem uh, in the past uh, since, uh, since uh, our toy, and I brought uh, Zoom online during the pandemic. We haven't had a problem with quorums. And um, I think since we've gone back to regular meetings, the, the, the current board would know this better than I. I. I don't think there's been a quorum problem in person at an in-person meeting. I think sometimes maybe, you know, we're counting the people that are still coming in the door, uh, hopefully, um, that we can uh, hold a meeting. I think we can, uh, in my view, I think we can hold a meeting regardless. It's only when we need okay. a quorum to pass legislation that we sweat it out a little bit. Okay. If that's... that doesn't happen, then we have to postpone things. All right. And that's about time. Okay. The next one we'll do, and this one will be for you, Lennox, is how will you balance transparency and the need for more transparency if you think that's needed and, and privacy and how you balance those two things between things that need to be disclosed to membership and decisions that you know maybe aren't exposed to membership and what's your opinion on that yeah well um you know when a when a new when a candidate comes on that you know maybe hasn't has never been elected to a fair one office before yes appointed and vote chief and that but if you haven't been elected um, they they tend to talk about things like this, like transparency and inclusivity and responsibility. 
And it's a, and it's a little bit insulting because it implies that this has never happened before in any other administration at Fairwind going back 55, 58 years, whatever it is now. So I think I think there's uh, I think there's plenty of transparency uh, and involvement. And a fair winder can involve him or herself in anything. Just show up at a meeting or or crew on a boat or train a member. Um, transparency, I, I guess, unless we're talking about opening up every Harbor Committee meeting and every board meeting to an open session, that's probably the only time when there could be more transparency if it's not a closed session regarding confidential matters. Um, I think we, yeah, I think we could do that if it hasn't already been done. I, I, I don't think that the Mark Levine administrations have done that um, any differently than I did or Alan McGovern or Richard Winterbank or Marv Brown or all those guys before me. But um, yeah, I'm open to, you know, you know, whatever. I at a club where, you know, we kind of hope that a quorum will show up. It seems like okay. uh, increased member involvement may not be the most burning issue, but uh, sure. I'm willing to listen to it and try to adapt to it and accommodate it. Okay. Steven, uh, how would you balance the need for disclosure versus privacy on club matters and, and, and under your administration? Well, I think it's very important that people's privacy and dignity be, be honored and that they, they feel like the club is a safe place. I also feel that club business is club business and it should not be hidden from members. I think it's not that hard to make that distinction. If it's club business, it's club members are entitled to know about it. If it's private business, then uh, there's discretion and respect for privacy involved. Uh, but I, I, I very much strongly advocate that members be able to attend all meetings of all officers. Uh, I, I, it's interesting that you don't remember this, Lennox, because that was the case when you were chair, chairing the Harbor Committee and you were the one who ended it. So I'm glad to hear that you're willing to reinstate it. I think it's a real benefit. All right, Lennox, you'll have a very, very short amount to respond if you would like to. Well, um, yeah, I think I've said everything. I okay. Think about, it. think about the matter. Uh, then the next one for Stephen. Uh, what's your opinion on rules and bylaws? Should they be enforced? And maybe paraphrasing the, the question. You know, do you think that there's flexibility enough in the bylaws or do you think that there's a need for more specificity or uh, what's your opinion on the current state of the club documents? Well, I tried to allude to that in my opening statement. I think the bylaws are a shambles and the standing rules are a disgrace. Anyone with any imagination can interpret that they mean anything they wish them to mean. This does no one any good. It permits uh, those who don't respect the rule of law, whatever that is, or have great personal ambition or low integrity, to say that the bylaws support whatever they choose to do. I want the bylaws to be clear, crystal clear. Now, I'm not pretending that it's easy to formulate bylaws that have clarity but it's an obligation of the organization to its members that the bylaws be very clearly understood, that the standing rules be quite explicit as to who does what. And I'm gonna go beyond the question. Uh, officers, although they have a lot of discretion and a lot of latitude, officers take an oath of office. They must be accountable when they don't honor that oath. When they depart from the standing rules and the bylaws and do things quite contrary to them, contrary even to the very unclear bylaws we have today. And I, my ambition is to have very clear, precise bylaws. 
as to um, where I stand on rigidity, I'm much more uh, in favor of live and let live. I'm much more in favor with the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. Someone who was responding to my membership statement uh, or my candidate statement emailed me and he said, you know, you got to figure out, are we a bunch of parliamentarians who occasionally go sailing? Or are we a bunch of sailors who occasionally have parliamentary discussions? And, you know, I got to say, nothing is a binary, nothing is an either or, but I really come down on the side of a bunch of people who love the sea, love sailing, love the opportunity to do it with one another. And we'll get to, to lawyering up only when we really have exhausted all possibilities. Conflict and confrontation just suck. It drains all the good feeling out of this place. We need to be collaborative. We need to live and let live. We need to respect differences, even those we don't agree with. We're here to sail together. We're not gonna to vote together. We're not gonna to worship together necessarily. Uh, we're not gonna to go to school boards together and duke it out about what should, book should be in the library. But let's keep this a safe, comfortable place to All sail. Right, All right, thanks. Uh, Lennox, what are your opinion on the rules and bylaws? Yeah, With well, what type of rigidity should they be enforced? I, I think they're in, I think they're in very good shape. I think they could be better. Um, if you look at my candidate statement um, uh, during my administrations, we did do uh, we did pass ten pieces of legislation that tried to make uh, things more um, serving the general realities, the changing realities that happen in the club. Uh, regarding what Stephen says, if you know if if the if the attitude would be to to you know to live and let live and go by the letter of the law i i don't i don't understand why he 30 seconds earlier needed to be very specific and very clear about what each bylaw and standing rule says um i do agree with him that uh the officers have uh sworn to uphold the bylaws uh and uh, standing rules in their roy niber oath of office um i don't I don't have a sense that that is really enforced much over the past two years. Um, discipline for one thing. Um, I think uh, everybody likes the thought of having to have rules and discipline, except when it comes to when they may be subject to discipline, they, then they don't like discipline so much anymore. So that's unfortunate. Um, uh, in addition to those 10 pieces of legislation, I'm, uh, working with, uh, like I said earlier, Phil and Alan McGovern and um, Bruce Gale and Bill Connor. Um, who am I missing? There's another person I'm missing there. I'm sorry, I can't. Who that fifth person is? Um, and we've started back in April to get a fine tooth, go with a fine tooth comb through the whole thing. I think there are some inconsistencies between the bylaws and the standing rules, and I think a lot of this may have happened when. Um, there was an effort to bring down some of the functionality that happens in Fairwind from the board level to the Harbor Committee level. A lot of it was done right, but I think there were some skips uh, and some maybe inconsistencies and maybe even a few contradictions. So uh, that's what we are involved with since the first, since April 1. And like that's I said, we've time uh, on we've gone through about maybe a third of what, we've, of what we have to go through. Okay. Can I add something? Yes, quickly. The, uh, not only are the bylaws, in, in my opinion, uh, unclear and murky, but there is no mechanism whatsoever to hold an officer to account. As, as Lennox says, we all like the rules enforced until they want to enforce them on us. I don't, I'm, I'm quite fine with clear non-arbitrary, non-personalized rules being enforced on everyone. No one is above the law. Right. I would like the law to be clear and I'd like there to be a mechanism for enforcing it. At this time in our club, we have none. All right. All right, the uh, the next one we have, there's a couple questions in the chat and uh, otherwise related to the small boat 
fleet in both harbors and what your plan might be for for that in the upcoming term and i think uh i think lennox that would be your question to answer first okay so that question is what happens to small boats what's your policy for maintaining small boats in both of our harbors let's go yeah. with that um i think the small boat fleet um even even if we're even if we're not going to have new people coming into the club we may not need six or seven small boats. I don't know what Channel Islands has, but probably about the same. Uh, I think the small boat fleet uh, is important. I, I think uh, more than any other boat fleet, it would serve uh, members of the community with um, that are you know lower income or um, or not that experienced sailors. Um, Therefore, I would I would like to I would like the small boats to be as good as they possibly could be. Uh, I uh, I don't have any specific plans with them. I I tried to do some things with the boats with tillers, but there's a very strong following, for example, for uh, Rambly um, that that has a, a small group of very of very committed people, much like Slingshot. The trimaran and much like happy hours way back in 2012 uh, a comparatively few number of members sailed those boats but they don't want to give them up so uh even though um rambly and uh the catalina capri 22s are all sailed less than 500 hours this is coming from that um skip uh usage and community service report that i did that's online somewhere good luck finding it but if anyone wants it i can email my copies to you um, those boats tend to be used the last, the least, uh, you know, I, I think, I, I guess starting with Rambly, a 22 foot boat before you progress to the, to the 22 foot boats without boards is reasonable. Um, the reason that maybe the soldings aren't used as often is because they're not required. If we were to say require in the same way that we that we have to go on the Soling 27s before we move to the medium boat fleet, they'd be used much more. Um, having said that, uh, I guess in, I, in trying to make the small boat fleet better, as good as it could be, uh, I, I really wouldn't mind seeing everything with a tiller and an outboard engine go away eventually. Um, I could see maybe in the, not, not right. the near future, but more later, maybe, a fleet of Catalina 270s or maybe even the Catalina 28 Mark IIs being small boats being moved down. Okay. Thanks, Lennox. I, I like this. I like the small boats. I, I want the small boats to be with us. I think the small boats serve the community well. I just loved helping the Boys and Girls Club the last few years. I mean, it really was one of the high points to teach these little kids. And some of them really not that interested in sailing, but wanting to have a boat ride. They didn't want to learn it. They actually, the, the, the sixth and seventh graders did kind of want to learn it. And it was a joy to be with them. I also love to sail and I am qualified on the big boats. And I, I just am so sad to see so many people treating the small boats like, ooh, that's something we have to do to get to where the real action is. If we had small boats that were fun, if we had Martins, if we had um, Harbor 20s, uh, if we had a small J, um, people like me who like to sail and don't have to be on a big boat all the time might come down when we had an hour and a half and didn't want to spend half of that time rigging and de-rigging and get on a Harbor 20 and just run around the harbor and then come back and put it away in less time than it's taking me to answer this question. We need a variety of small boats. We need a whole look at our assets. And that's not the question you asked. I'll try not to answer it, but I love the small boats. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see, for the next one, uh, I think both of you have kind of touched on this on your statements, but maybe a little bit more details around what, what's your plan for increasing member participation and club activities specifically around cleaning and maintaining the boats, not just paying dues and going out for a sale. I think someone referenced it as a charter company versus a volunteer 
Yacht Club. And that would be, I forgot who we were on, but I assume that's you, Stephen, to answer that one first. Sure, I think that's a really good question because it gets to the core of why I'm running. I really decry the the motion toward uh, a cheap charter fleet. I I I want um, I want people to feel like this is a club that they belong to, and one of the things I've learned in in other aspects of my life, if you want to know, if you want to look at something, if you want to measure something, I'm sorry, if you want to change something, the first thing you have to do is measure it. We have no idea. So we have members that are spending literally hundreds of hours a year servicing club boats. And we have members that don't pick up a rag. Um, I don't want to shame anyone. I don't want to blame anyone. I don't want to make it negative. But I do want to give accolades to the people who keep our fleet going. We have an old fleet, sometimes a very tired fleet. And to the people who give of themselves to make it going, I know they're not doing it so they can get cash and prizes. <laughs> but, you know, camaraderie, some acknowledgement goes a long way. I think uh, having coffee and a donut is just a teeny tiny way to get that going. I think our collaborative efforts can be more social. They can also involve more teaching. Uh, there's a way to clean a boat. There's a way to make, mark an anchor road. A lot of labor in laying out that road on the dock. There's a way to mark it. We have people who are expert at that. Let's make it a class and get a whole bunch of people who would like to learn how to mark an anchor road. I'm just using that as an example. This is not about anchor roads here, folks. But we will get much more participation when it feels good to participate. Thanks, Stephen. Lennox, do you remember the question or you want me to read it to you? Yeah, I think I do. <laughs> uh, I, I, I agree with just about everything Steve said there. Uh, it, it's always been a challenge to get people to clean their boats when they come back. Um, and Maybe they don't really know how to clean a boat. I don't know. Uh, I know it got to the point where Drew Baldwin, a couple of years ago, when he was rear commodore, brought in a, a cleaning crew every month or quarter, I forget. I don't know if that's still going on, but but it had kind of eroded to the point where that was, you know, I don't know if it was seen as necessary, but definitely additive. Um, I, you know, I would like to see members just, if they could just not get into trouble when they're on the water. I mean, if, if there's, if some gear fails and breaks, okay, that's one thing, but just not get, just don't run aground, don't have problems undocking and docking. And then when you're done with on the water and you're back at the slip, clean the boat. And I, I think we'd all be much happier if we could do that, but it's been a challenge. I, I think uh, Steve said something about making it more social. I think that's probably a, a good idea. I, I, I know Paula Brilson has done some barbecues or something. Um, I regret to say that I have never been able to make one of those damn barbecues, but I, I wanted to. And I, and I, I wonder if, uh, if during those things, if there was more of a camaraderie uh, involved with uh, people going for a sale and then cleaning a boat. Um, and I think also at the fleet captain, you know, I think the fleet captain could hold uh, classes that are, you know, more dockside related, like uh, how to how to uh, coil lines, how to mark an anchor road, um, how to how to tie knots. I, I I tried to do that myself a few years ago, but um, it, 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 you know, it eroded to like where no one wanted to do that. And, and so instead of like tying spring lines with cleat hitches at a mid sheet cleat, now we just, we just tie a loop and a line and then throw that over the cleat. So that's our spring line. So that's your time, which is okay. But, you know, it's, uh, it, it indicates that maybe there's not a whole lot of willingness to actually do things entirely correctly. All right. The next question, uh, is another one that's been asked a few times, uh, 
what are your ideas or what's your thoughts on controlling costs around legal fees and just uh, operating costs in general? Uh, you can layer in a membership dues increase uh, in there if you want as well. Who are you asking? What are your, what's Tell your me again. on controlling costs of the club, specifically around legal fees, general operating costs of the, of the club? And, you know, there was another question related to the dues increase that happened earlier this year, if you want to opine on that as well. Is Jason, that me or is that Stephen? Are you directing that question to me or to... to That's going to be Lennox first and then you next, Stephen. Okay. Um, I'm, I was really, uh, I was really happy to see the dues increase go through. I think it's been, I mean, I, well, no one wants to pay more money, I guess, but, but it's, it, it's long overdue. I think it's something that probably should have happened around... Geez, 2016, 2018. Um, it didn't happen until we actually began to run out of money. I think during, was it the first Mark Levine administration? I think, I'm not sure. I think I heard two years. So I'm glad it's, I'm glad it's ha happened. Um, having enough cash reserve to fight legal challenges is, is a, a big concern of mine. Um, I brought in, uh, I recruited and brought in our external club counsel, Jill David. Jeez, uh, I'm going to say that was 2018. Maybe I did that. And she has been involved in, uh, she and Scott Kelly and Dave Lumian and Lynn Erickson have been involved in two major legal battles up in Channel Islands due to incursions made by uh, Seabridge Marina. I think we're going to have another lawsuit in Marina Del Rey pretty soon. So um, I don't know. I I, I think uh, that dues increase is uh, has, was a very important one. Um, the other thing that I've done is um, I was able, along with others, to uh, renew our expired slip fee subsidies of about $35,000 a year into um, a double, we doubled that, uh, $70,000 uh, annual slip fee waivers and uh, I think we should definitely keep up with that. It requires uh, it requires renewal uh, validation of renewal each year. Now, um, if we were to lose that, um, I think we figured it out a, a few years ago. Uh, every every member's dues would probably go up about fifty dollars a quarter. I think that's your time, Lennox. Okay, thank you. All right, Stephen. So first, I want to say that uh, I'm opposed to dues increases. Not never, never, but as a last resort. Uh, second, uh, then has done some very fine things for the club, and thank you for that service. Uh, third, um, we are somewhat flying blind fiscally, and it's unfortunate. We are like doing checkbook accounting, no insults intended, but we don't have a club budget. We don't have money in pockets allocated for things like lawsuits, which are going to happen. Much is being done to properly um, make formal agreements with those with whom we contract so we're not so vulnerable as we have occasionally been in the past. But um, to be told we have plenty of money and then to be told, oh, let's go spend $180,000 on boats. And then let's be, oh, we've got to have a dues increase. That didn't feel good. I don't dispute that it was necessary. Uh, I think it would be responsible to have had a little more advance warning. This club has lost money two of the last three years. Now, someone will say, well, that's just on paper. We're a nonprofit. Well, I think members should have access. And someone would say to me, oh, of course they do have access. You try and find it. It can be found. You've got to be really interested and really diligent. I want people to know the numbers. Maybe there should be something in, and I'm not advocating this without further consideration. Maybe the newsletter should have something. Maybe they should a space on the website where fiscal condition, this is where we are this month. There needs to be a way for members to be aware that this club costs money, what costs what, 
and where we're getting the money from. That's time. And rather than getting, just one moment, please, rather than getting money only from members, only the way we do, I think there are numerous alternative and additional sources of revenue that we must be exploring if we're going to come into the fully up to date. All right. And then maybe the last question we'll leave it on before the closing statement is uh, what do you think the board members can do to increase the collegiality between each other and the overall collegiality with the club as a whole? And that's for you, Stephen. I think board members would advance the interests of the club if they were cordial to all other board members, if they weren't tiny, very powerful cliques within the board, if they were inclusive in terms of sharing what they deliberate about with members, if they voluntarily stopped being on the board after seven, eight, five years, let new blood, let new talent, even admittedly, they may not be as good, especially when they start. Maybe we need a mentoring system so that people can start with some help from the seasoned people. But board members have to be more collegial with one another, with members, and to be more willing to step aside. All right, Lennox. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think there is uh, a lot of clickiness in the club uh, among some members. I, I don't know how big it is. Uh, I, I'd like to see that go away. Um, I think there's a kind of a general, I don't know how big this is, but kind of a, a general distrust of people that the membership elects to the board and Harvard committees. Um, I, you know, when I was coming up through the ranks, as it were, I never really distrusted, you know, the board or the, maybe there was one guy that from Channel Islands that lasted a term that I didn't like, but everyone else I, you know, felt really good about. But I, I don't think that everyone feels that way necessarily. Um, I would like to see uh, the board and the Harbor committees, you know, have a, I think a mix of uh, experience and the boat selection committees, every committee, I think should have a mix of an experienced person uh, versus new blood. Um, Steve, you know, it's, it's pretty, he's pretty nervy coming in, I think, uh, not having had an elected office and start wants to start a Commodore. That I, That's something I would, I would not have done that myself. Uh, I wasn't even sure as poor captain if I, if I wanted to do that. Um, but uh, he, you know, he's a smart guy. Um, he's run a successful ketamine clinic for several years. Um, so he has must have business savvy and so on. So uh, there, there's some truth there. But I, I would like to see all of this clickiness go away and, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, let's get you elected. We'll run a phone tree or, you know, whatever happens. And, uh, or let's, you know, let's, let's go campaign in the other Harbor where we're not, or, or our, our uh, less than favorable reputation isn't as well known. I, I think that kind of thing really should go away because that leads to divisiveness and combativeness. Thanks Lennox. Yep. Um, all right, so Stephen, since you went second, you can give your two minute closing first, or you can do it second. Up to you. What do you choose? Uh, I'll go second. Thank you. All right, Lennox, two minutes. Okay. Hard cap. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking. I wasn't really planning to run for Commodore, but uh, some things have happened over the past year or two uh, that. I've been encouraged to do that. And I'm if I were to win this, I, I would look forward to it. Um the, a lot of a lot of what I've a lot of what is a lot of a lot of what I wanted to accomplish has been accomplished, either uh by me or by you know my predecessors, like Channel Islands, 
a year or two ago, deciding to classify their new Catalina 320 as a medium boat. I th I admire them very much for that. Um, uh, to be sure, it was a little easier to pull off in Shadow Islands for reasons I could go into at some other time, but um, uh, I, I'd like to see that happen in Marina del Rey. I understand why, I understand the resistance and reasons against it. Um, I think anything that happens to a particular boat where a small group of people are particularly invested would probably should happen in the same way that happy hours and the and the trimaran happened that that no action would be taken until the whole body of members agreed to it like the trimaran okay they would ra I'd rather have a catamaran than the trimaran okay so that happened and then uh, I remember Sparrow way back in the uh happy hours days like we won't sell happy hours until we get a 38 a new 38 foot boat so that was the right approach and I think that's probably the right approach for any boat to be replaced, even if there's a comparatively small number of people using it. So um, I yeah, want to thank everyone you. for uh, your time tonight and for the election committee or whoever it was that organized this. And um, I hope to see you all very soon on the dots, on the water or on Zoom or in a, pers in a personal meeting on the 21st, right, 21st. Thank you, Lennox. We appreciate your willingness to serve the club. Thank you. All right, Stephen, two minutes. Thank you for that, and thank you for your attention tonight. I hope I've answered your questions. I don't have anything new to say that I haven't already said to you. Uh, just to reiterate, I've been asked to be Commodore, to try to run for Commodore several times. I declined because I was working full time. I've retired, and I intend to give this my all. Thank you, Lennox, for acknowledging how crazy this is. I don't think anyone is doing this for the cash and the prizes. <laughs> and, uh, there is no cash just to clarify so everybody's aware <laughs> yeah well i hope i'm speaking to people well enough for them to get that yeah <laughs> but i do think the club has moved in a direction away from what endeared it to me and i'm here to try not by myself but as a catalyst for all of you to move it back in a more collegial direction thank you Thank you, Stephen, and thank you as well for your willingness to volunteer. Um, all right, so that wraps us up. We'll have uh, two minutes. We'll get Paula and Bruce off mute, and then uh, uh, we'll flip through the coin flip. Paula's heads, Bruce will be tails. This is the most exciting part for me. So, And then that's a head, so Paula, you'll be going first with the five-minute opening. And then uh, unmute Bruce. All right, Bruce, are you there? Yes. Okay. All right, Paul, when you're ready, take it away. Five minutes. Uh -huh. Thanks so much. Did this you is... say there was going to be a two-minute break? Or did I miss that? We can have a two-minute break. Do you want a two-minute break? I, I'm fine to go on. We want to ask the members to raise their hands. <laughs> Let's take a two-minute break. How about that? We'll get going at 9.01. Thank you. All right. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them in the Q and A device thing that we that we were using before. That seemed to work well. Uh, or if you have trouble with that, just throw them into the chat, and we'll we'll get them there.
All right, Paul, when you're ready. All right, thank you. And thank you everybody for staying on to support me and the other candidates. So I, I'd like to start out by sharing a story. So I'm originally from New York, if, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> And uh, my favorite restaurant for many years was a family style uh, restaurant place in Little Italy. I went there all the time. I told everyone I knew to go there. Um, but one day I walked past the kitchen and the door was open and I saw the wait staff taking the unfinished food from the customer's plate and scraping them back into the pots. Well, naturally. I never went back to that restaurant. I tell that story because it relates to my experience at Fairwind and why I'm running for MDR membership secretary. You see, unlike the restaurant where there are many other spots to choose from, Fairwind is so unique. I mean, where else can you learn to sail, have access to a, a full fleet of boats that you and can cruise with members or friends? for like such a reasonable price. We have just these incredible volunteers. They commit so much time teaching us, maintaining our boats, organizing events, paying our bills and so forth. I have seen so many acts of kindness since I joined this club three years ago. Like how over a hundred volunteers came together, brought food to our barbecues, Others manning the grill and just like enjoying camaraderie. Or how our dedicated members really maintain, which is, which is one of the cornerstones of our club, our boys and girls club and our veterans program. But I have also seen inside the kitchen. Now I don't doubt for a moment that most of our officials have really good intentions. But to put it kindly, sometimes they're a little misguided. Last year I was appointed election chair and I worked with volunteers who were dedicated to running a fair process. I saw firsthand how that's possible to facilitate a smooth campaign through collaboration, respect and clear communication. So after that experience, I, I began to pay a little more attention to the club and its governance. When we were told that our club operated as a, at a deficit for two years, I listened. I listened to the outspoken members who requested an audit. And that as a result of that request, that audit is currently underway. I also reviewed a draft rule six regarding our, our future boat acquisitions that in my opinion, and I think the opinion of others that would put more authority in the hands of the Harbor Committee. I know this to be true because objections were raised so much so that we had to postpone the vote on the change to rule six. So these outspoken members really gave me the courage to run. A position that not only serves the MDR Harbor, but also uh, you know, on the Harbor Committee, but also the board. So since I announced my candidacy, I've been hearing a number of good ideas for membership. And I asked them, why don't you bring them up at membership meetings? And here's what I've heard. This is the way things have been done. Or I don't want to get involved in politics. I just want to sail. <clears throat> but the most concerning thing I heard was from people who said that they're afraid to speak out for fear of possible backlash or even suspension. Regarding the specific duties of MDR secretary, I, I will have a lot to learn, but that's, you know, that's what we do. We jump in. I didn't know how to sail when I joined this club. I didn't know a halyard from a sheet, and now I'm a 103 member. I realize that this is a big responsibility. And I have some- 30 seconds. 
I have some reference. In fact, two years ago, I was appointed to a committee to review our membership application process. And if I'm elected, I would have, I would make that process more uh, transparent and revive that initiative for your ap approval. So, you know, Fairwind has given me so much, friendship, even family. And for this, I feel like I need to do my small part to make this club continue to be an affordable volunteer run organization and my commitment will be reflected in my prompt communication to members to address their concerns. It's members time, Paul. Feel supported and validated. Thanks for listening. All right, Bruce, five minutes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, since joining in 2014, it's been a privilege to serve in this role for the past eight years. And I'm very grateful for the trust that you've placed in me. Through my work in this position, I've had the pleasure of getting to know many of you. The role of membership secretary is more than just paperwork. It's about ensuring that each new member feels welcomed and understands what makes Fairwind special. This position allows for close collaboration with the Harbor Committee, the Board of Directors, to represent all club members. Over the years, I've helped more than 300 new members join our club and a priority was to increase diversity, particularly boosting female representation. Of those 300 plus members, 75 were women, which is something that we can all be proud of. Each month I talk with prospective members, sharing what makes Fairwind so special and how we operate. Each application is carefully reviewed, <clears throat> focusing not only on their sailing skills and member referrals, but also our trainer's insights, and how well the applicant will fit into our community. This process ensures that new members will thrive here, contributing to and enhancing our already vibrant and supportive club. We truly have a fantastic community of members. I want to thank everyone who's helped me along over the years. To the trainers, instructors, board members, past and present, committee members, boat chiefs, assistant boat chiefs, cruise directors, dock masters, and every volunteer who contributes to our great club. You've been invaluable to me. Recently, I've been a part of a dedicated team working hard to update and clarify our bylaws and standing rules. It's been a big project over the last five months, but we're making great progress, and I'm excited that we'll be presenting more updates at the general membership meeting on the 21st. Having clear rules and bylaws is crucial for protecting our club and our members as well. Another initiative that I'm proud of is ensuring that our outside contractors provide proof of insurance, naming Fairwind as additional insured, or if they don't have insurance, requiring them to sign our hold harmless agreement to protect our club from potential lawsuits. Promoting volunteerism is a top priority because it strengthens connections and makes every member feel valued. Our club thrives on a strong sense of community built by volunteers who create an inclusive environment for everyone. We've grown into a big sailing club and I want you to know that I really care about Fairwind. I work tirelessly to make this club the best that it can be. And as many of you have seen, I'm fully committed to doing whatever it takes to keep Fairwind thriving. I put my heart and my soul into this club. Teaching boys and girls, mem the, the boys and girls club members, how to sail has been a joy and sharing the love of a sport and then hearing their stories makes the experience even more rewarding. Recently, I had a, the privilege of skippering one of our boats on a day sail for 25 military veterans organized by one of our members. It was a great day on the water and it was an opportunity to give back to those who have served our country. If reelected, my goal is to continue these efforts and more. As our club has grown, it's become increasingly important to establish a financial planning committee to ensure our fiscal soundness and begin upgrading our fleet with newer, better boats. Plans also include starting a volunteer recognition program and celebrating members' achievements. Fairwind means a lot to me, and I'm committed to ensuring the club remains a welcoming, inclusive, and vibrant community. 
the importance of diversity, volunteerism, and continuous improvement cannot be overstated. And these values will continue to be advocated if I'm elected. If I come off as passionate or something more than that, it's because I want Fairwind to survive whatever storms roll in. I care about our club. As always, I'll maintain open lines of communication with all members and continue contributing to Fairwind's long-term success alongside our friendly and dedicated community. Serving as your membership secretary has been extremely fulfilling and I would like very much to continue in this capacity. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. That was exactly five minutes, Bruce. That's great. Um, all right, so we'll have the first question. Uh, we have a little more limited ones coming in, but maybe we'll take this middle one here. So with what the current criteria for accepting memberships and when people are accepted into the club, are there any changes you would like to see uh, during your term that you would, that you would pursue? Yeah, who's that? I guess let's go Bruce first and then Paul, you'll be uh, in, uh, two minutes after him. You know, I, I think that we're doing a pretty good job and, and have been. Um, Richard Windebank was the one who, kind of talked me into this um, eight years ago and gave me some guidelines. And, you know, I've been able to go ahead and improve on those a little bit. I can say that we always have a wait list at MDR to get into the club. As long as I've been uh, in this position, there's never been a time when we don't have anybody that doesn't want to get in. So whether it's people that come to our uh, monthly open houses or our Tuesday work days. I think that uh, we're doing a, a pretty good job. And as far as bringing in just good folks and hopefully, you know, I, as Lennox was saying, I try to find people who have some sailing experience under their belts. Love to get the 101s and 103s, but sometimes you can't do that. And so <sighs> since, we, since we are an ASA you know, sanctioned sailing club. Um, we teach people and obviously between our trainers and our instructors, we love to do it. And it's amazing how uh, Paula was just mentioning, you know, she didn't know a sheet from the high or whatever. And it's now a 103. I'm the same thing. I came in this club. I had no say other than racing. I had no ASA designations. And of course now I've got, you know, up through my 105 and my 114. And I've you know, been able to do that uh, as a result of Fairwind. I think this is a great club uh, as far as doing anything more for bringing it in. We're always crowded. We've got wait lists again now for our medium boats, uh, our large boats. We're, we're full once, once again. Um, it's but I, just can't think of, I can't think of anything else that we could really do. All right, Paul. All right. Um, thank you, Bruce, for your response. I have reviewed some emails back and forth when we talk about our process. I guess a couple of um, the phrases uh, make me a little uncomfortable that um, that we evaluate new members based on their personality and general fit for the club. I think those are phrases that could actually get us in trouble down the line um, as we grow. And um, I have advocated for a process, if you will, a process to um, that also the new members understand how they're um, how they're being evaluated, um, what they should be looking for. We could have this published on our website um, just to kind of give members a, a, a path for admittance and um, and also maybe encourage them to uh, to volunteer a little more and um, get them out on the docks and meeting other members. Um, and that to me is the fit. The fit is based on if they're willing to come out and sail with us and pitch in. Um, I don't know what a personality trait looks like. I think we're all very diverse in this club. And uh, I certainly like those that actually give me a little hard time sometimes. Those are the ones that make me grow. So anyway, um, that's my response. Bruce, did you have any anything else or are we good with that one? Well, I, I, what I can say is, is that we don't judge on personality, just personality. 
we we definitely look for people who are we think are going to be uh, friendly and fit in with the club. We, we obviously can't tell. We've had some people that have uh, eventually left the club either on their own or through termination because they've just done some very very strange things. Um, but the the idea is is that I t I too have have always been advocating volunteerism. I'm always looking for um, assistance, an assistant membership secretary, an assistant rear commodore for maybe the way they do it up at CIH with uh, the small boats, medium boats, large boats, things like that to help people out uh, and to, to pick up some of the load. I don't think there's any trouble. I don't think there's any trouble that, that's ahead with what we're doing. All right, thanks, Bruce. Uh, Paul, may I respond, may I just- uh, Yeah, but I mean, yeah. We'll just very briefly. You're all night on the same question, but yeah, go ahead. All right, just very briefly. I think that um, you know what Steve mentioned before about the Stephen mentioned the the mentorship program. Like for example, when I conducted the the you know when I organized the barbecues, I, I worked with a couple of people, and now they can take over the barbecues, like Marlo and 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 Kelly. And I think like me board members are really they work a lot of hard. They work really hard and put in a lot of hours and we should be, that's the mentorship program by getting the assistance. I totally support that, Bruce. Maybe uh, this will be for you, Paula, first, maybe kind of expanding then on what you both touched on and also what was touched on with the Commodores. When we talk about wanting to encourage volunteerism and that aspect of, of the membership, you know, how specifically do you think you could contribute to that being a, a larger part of what the club's about. Right. Well, that would, uh, I could go on for more than two minutes, but I would start out by this. We have so much technology that's available to us today, whether it's using Google Docs or Google Calendaring to enable us to collaborate. Right now, we're still texting each other. Hey, is there room on that boat for me to go out? Or, you know, um, and, and trying to, you know, coordinate training where we could just really use the tools that are available to us. And, um, and that would, um, and, and, you know, and that would kind of help to encourage volunteerism. And yes, absolutely. I like that Tony Knight kind of took the, um, initiative following the barbecue where we gave awards to the people who did the most training and now I see that included in our newsletter um and you know we're a little competitive as sailors so I think I think that encourages people to get out and put in some more hours when they see another trainer out there um you know putting in the time so those are just a couple of ideas thanks all right Bruce uh fostering volunteerism and how you would contribute to that yeah. So, for example, you know, we we set up a mentorship program. Arlene DeAnda and I got together, and she and Larry do a great job with our new members getting them acclimated to the club. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Kelly, um, I was I asked her specifically because she put that on her application that she likes to do events, and so I asked Kelly. I said if she would like to go ahead and step up and help out with the barbecue things like that. So I'm always trying to work on the people to. Uh, volunteer. I think it's a, it absolutely it connects people to to our club, to our members. Um, it's a very important thing, and it's as far as I'm concerned, it's pretty much what it's the the best part of our club for the people's for the people who partake in it. For those that just come down and want to charter a boat, um, they're they're not having the advantage that we're having who get involved. Great. Paula, did you have anything? No, I'm good. Great. All right. So maybe one more. I'm trying to kind of coalesce a couple of these. So maybe one more about that, uh, about membership admittance and the requirements to be admitted. So the first question is asking about the push and pull between us being an ASA certified sailing school and then having sailing experience be a criteria or at least a favorable criteria that we look at upon admittance and, you know, how you would uh, reconcile, you know, the obvious easier onboarding of someone with sailing experience and our position as an ASA certified sailing school. And then what maybe Paulo kind of expanding on what you've touched on and giving you an opportunity, Bruce, what sort of 
maybe mechanical devices would there be where we could evaluate new members and 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 provide some sort of maybe grading or objective determination of of their suitability for the club and that would be you first bruce so already we've set it up so that we do have a sailing evaluation of the members that are on the wait list we send them an email an invitation to come by and do a, a, a trial sale evaluation just to see their skills. Our, our club is made up of boats and those are our assets. We don't have buildings, things like that. And so we just feel as though that it's important that we protect our assets. The majority of the uh, accidents that happen are with our small boat new members that end up uh, hitting the lured boats on G1400 uh, and if I can find out that a, that a member um, has more sailing experience so that they're not involved in that over somebody that just absolutely has done no sailing whatsoever, um, I think that it, it's just uh, it's a financial issue as well uh, for our club. Um, I'm actually, uh, the way I see things being done they're, they're being done right. However, what we're doing now in terms of looking at uh, putting together a financial uh, plan for the future, uh, getting getting over to the the dues, I think that we really do need to raise dues on, on a CPI. Um, these are just some of, some of the other ideas that I think that are important. We need to be financially, fiscally responsible and be able to constantly be doing the best that we can for the club. All right, Paul. Well, first, I think members should be able to swim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, um, well, you know, everything we talked about, the, the skills they bring to the club, uh, volunteerism, their sailing experience, recommendation from other club members, and Bruce, to your point, yes, yeah, so no one has a crystal ball. Sometimes people come in as new members and it doesn't work out. To that end, I would consider uh, proposing to the membership that we have a provisional membership period, say three months, giving them the opportunity to complete their application. Let's say there's X amount of uh, volunteer hours that are part of that application. Um, because everyone can come and volunteer as though they'll continue to do so in order to get in. But what are they doing once they're in? And that's where I'd like to kind of look at that process in the beginning of a really appoint an existing member to be responsible for that member. Um, if they're a member of mentor, if you will. So um, that's a, a couple of things that I would uh, put before the board in addition to other objective criteria um, to ensure that new members will, you know, cooperate as a, you know, Corinthian sailor in our club. Thanks. Anything more on that, Bruce? Yeah, that's, there's always been a problem with that. You know, you never know if the, the person who comes into the club is, you know, they volunteer, 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 and all of a sudden, as soon as they get in the club, you don't see them again, but you sure see them on Schedule Master. Um, <laughs> but you never can tell who that person's gonna be. And a provisional, we've talked about that before, where maybe that there is a, a time period and um, you know, could be even six months to give people an opportunity to get acclimated to the club. Um, it, that probably is a good idea, but it's just really tough to monitor and manage all these things. We ask for volunteers all the time to step up and everybody always is, you know, I'm open to it. Um, can I do it on a Tuesday at 4 p.m.? We need the, the people who are, are genuine volunteers. Uh, we need to have more of those. We need to have more people who are like the rest of our club because we basically boil down to, I'm guessing that it's around, what, 50 people who do almost all of the volunteering in our club. Okay. Um, Paula, give yeah, me the last it's, word. It's generally the 80-20 rule, right? Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, no, I don't have, have anything to, okay. uh, to add to that question. All right. Uh, so I think we're now on to you, Paula. So again, this is kind of expanding stuff that's already come up, but 
what do you see your role in monitoring the financial condition of the club and how would you contribute to uh, communicating that to membership? Okay, so um, great. I'm a lawyer. Don't hold that against me. I I represent entrepreneurs and startups like the good guys. And um, one of the things is I'm very particular about what I sign my name to. I'm not going to sign my name to a report that I didn't review. And um, there are a number of reports that we have to submit indicating that we have certain policies in place. Um, we're submitting financials. And um, and so I, I really take that responsibility seriously. And um, I understand that we have audits. Um, I also think that um, a lot of uh, particular board members are overworked. And again, we're 600 members now. Maybe there are ways to use some third party services um, to, to help alleviate some of the day-to-day, -day, if you will, paperwork um, to spread out the responsibilities a little more. I think sessions like these, I mean, I, I can't believe it's almost uh, nine o'clock and there's still the same amount of people here. I think members like want this opportunity to, to speak, to ask these questions. And I don't feel like the membership meetings always afford that opportunity. So um, I'm, I'm really happy about that. And I also wanted to add that our Zoom, uh, we used to have the issue of 100 uh, members, uh, a max. And I have expanded that now to you know, where it's like 300, 300 at any given time. And I'd really hope that the board, um, that the future membership meetings will include Zoom or whatever, um, you know, virtual meetings when our members are traveling because for the most part, 100 people are showing up. So what are we talking about? 600 members and about 100 people are making all the decisions. So I feel like let's create a more inclusiveness opportunity, whether it's using Google Docs to share and collaborate on our new rules or you know, having these uh, meetings um, where, you know, board meetings where members can listen in and participate in the dialogue before the executive board goes off and does the work of the executive board, which is voting on those initiatives, having heard from a full scope of members and not the same 80-20 rule like we talked about that show up. So thanks. All right, Bruce. What was what was the question again? <laughs> I was waiting for someone to ask that because I forget forgot him while you guys. Um, so the question was: Is what role do you intend to play in in monitoring the financial condition of the club and reporting that to membership? So I, I you know, we're in the process of um, now getting after after seeing what happened over the last two years um, and watching. I think. Two years ago, and again, you can't hold me to these numbers. I'm not a, an accountant. I think we were we were off by maybe two or three thousand dollars, and then it was maybe seventy or eighty thousand or, or so. But I think a lot of that has to do with the depreciation of our boats. Um, I understand depreciation because I'm in real estate, things like that. But I, I feel as though that our depreciation schedule needs to be evaluated. Um, I think that. Uh, Obviously, having an audit committee, we've got to be more focused on an, on an annual basis. Excuse me, it's, it could be on a quarterly basis, but it needs to be done because you can't you can't run a club of six hundred and forty people and just go by the seat of your pants. Um, now that we are that large, if we if we were to admit any more people or reopen the club or get larger or open up another harbor, we would have to hire outside help. And of course, when we do that, our budget's gonna have to go up, our dues are gonna have to go up, people are gonna have to pay more per quarter, things like that. I don't know if that's such a, a really good idea, if that's what we want, but obviously input from every member helps. I don't have a problem with opening up our, mem our meetings to members. I know that they used to be open, years and years ago. However, after a while, no one showed up at the meetings. And so that's why somehow they got closed down. And so that's, um, it, it's basically, if if people are interested, I'm fine with it. If, I, if I'm 
re-elected, I'm totally fine with that. Anything else, Paula? Um, all right, then, Bruce, this is a very procedural, very specific question, but uh, should members be allowed to pick what harbor they want to belong to instead of the current method of locating them based on their residence, I assume? So when I um, initially took this job, um, Richard always told me that um, the person's permanent residence, where they live, the permanent residence, the closer you are to the harbor is the harbor that will be your home harbor. And so that's just kind of been an unwritten rule and we have followed it for a very long time. Odin and I have gone over on several uh, people. Um, we have on occasion made a couple of uh, exceptions. Personally, I don't have a problem with it. And the reason I don't have a problem is because we at MDR always or almost always, we have always had in the future, in the past, we've always had the wait list. And I know that ODED has been trying to recruit people to the harbor. And so if somebody wants to go to CIH, I don't have a problem with that. As long as it's something that we do consistently. Paula, would you, what's your opinion on assigning someone to a harbor based on their location or their preference? You know, I have to say, I really do see the pros and cons. Like on one hand, MDR maybe will be really heavy with with members. And, um, and then, um, but on the other hand, um, maybe there are ways that we can control that, like requiring uh, you have a, um, a member harbor um, that you have to do the bulk of your training or sail a certain amount of hours. Like to me, that's the kind of thing where I would, I wanna hear from the members what they think. I think it's something that the members get to vote on. And my opinion would be directed based on what the members have to say about that. Um, particularly when we can see the pros and cons of, of, um, of opening up. Uh, some members are very passionate about that and others feel that that would be, um, you know, not a great idea. What, what usually happens is, is that people say that they want to go ahead. They live in Venice, but because there's a wait list in MDR, they want to go ahead and say, well, I want CIH as my home harbor. And what do they do is they go to CIH or they're admitted, and then they come down to MDR and use our resources, our trainers, and things like that. And if that's the case, in other words, I, I would, I would, almost want to place a restriction that if you choose, if you live in Venice or somewhere else, El Segundo, and you want CIH as your harbor, then that's where you need to do the majority of your sailing out of it. I just feel as though that a lot of people have used it as a go around to get into the club. Okay. May I add? Um... Sure. And Bruce, you probably know this um, uh, better than me, but um, I wonder why we don't just have a club admission rather than a harbor admission. You know, maybe that's one of the things that could, you know, divides us a little bit. But if you say, hey, there's an opening in Channel, Channel Islands and you have to do X amount of training hours there um, rather than have this um, admission on a per harbor basis. Um, maybe it's a little idealistic. I'm just curious if if that had been discussed. Uh, Bruce, do you have anything else? Well, I, I can't say that we have discussed, you know, that specifically. I'm always open to new ideas, fresh ideas, things like that. And so it's, it, as far as I'm concerned, that's, it, it's worth having a, a conversation about. Great. Um, so Paul, you're up next for this one. What do you think the biggest challenge you would be facing as as in this role in the in in the upcoming term? I wasn't very eloquent, but <laughs> I hear you. Um, I really respect everyone who's committed so many years to volunteering for this club in a board position or otherwise. 
But one thing we find when people have been in a role for a long time, that they start to feel that they they have a there's a right way of doing things. And, and that's an opinion, but those opinions get formed from fatigue and fatigue gets formed by constantly having to ask the members or other people uh, their opinions. When it's much more efficient just to say, hey, we've got the requisite skills in this room, let's decide how to do this. But to me, that takes away from the spirit of what this club represents. I probably will be in the same position if I was on the board for three, five years. I'd start to be fatigued from it. I get it. And yeah. that's the reason why it makes sense. You know, there are certain clubs that have term limitations um, to, to bring in fresh ideas supported by the outgoing uh, officials. You know, one of the things Mark Commodore said when he stepped down is he looks forward to helping us all. I would expect to rely on him as anyone else because he's got a great deal of experience um, in, in helping us. So I hope that whoever, you know, wins the role of Commodore or, 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 or membership secretary, that they will have heard some of the things that we say tonight and, and read some of the comments that the members are putting because this, this, this is a club that's, you know, a volunteer organization run by the members. And I think we get away from that a little bit, not for malice, not for that reason, but just generally because we're busy and we're fatigued. And it's a good, it's good to have that reminder. Well, I can oh, I can you want the I question again? Oops. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the biggest challenge is going to be in, in Marina Del Rey membership secretary in the upcoming term? Well, I don't think there's going to be any big challenges. I will say this. Yes, I have been in this position for eight years, but I think I'm better this year than I was last. And I think I'm better last year than I was the year before and so on and so on. I've learned a lot. I would venture to say that every single member, there has never been a member that has brought something up to me where I have been closed-minded, where I haven't listened to them, where I haven't taken it to heart or brought these good ideas to our Harbor Committee and our board. And I feel that I am as fresh today as I've ever been. And I very much look forward to continuing if I'm voted in to this role. I will, I will continue to look for new ideas. I will continue to try to find people to volunteer for things. I will continue to do the best job that I can as membership secretary. All right. Uh, okay, looks like that is the conclusion of our questions. I have on my card that you went second, Bruce, so you have the option of your two minutes now or your two minutes after Paula. Paula, please go ahead. Why, well, thank you, Bruce. Thank you all for listening. Um, one of the things that I did before this session tonight is I looked at what is uh, the oath of office. And I think the one that um, there are a number of really good oaths. Um, but um, I think the one that really resonated with me is that I pledge to be respectful of dissenting opinions and cooperative in implementing the will of the members. And as many of you know, I'm I'm an outspoken person. And um, when I hear members saying that they're uncomfortable to speak up, members that have some really good ideas, I wanna get them excited. I want them to see that someone like me who didn't know how to sail and who joined this club, you know, three years ago is is going for it, is is speaking out, is, you know, taking, you know, listening to their concerns and trying to 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 bring them up and and have people consider them, um, and not hear things like, oh, the members aren't interested in that." Sorry, I, you you might know who I'm <laughs> imitating there, but um, you know, it's all in good fun. Look, I want to sail. I want to have a great time. I want to see fair wind, um, you know, preserved as an affordable. Uh, club run by the members and um, and we can 
put aside these differences, which we're able to do, strangely enough, um, and go out and sail and have a great time. And, and that's what I, I look forward to doing with you guys and hope that Fairwind's around for a long time to come. So thanks. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Take it away, Bruce. As I mentioned earlier, serving as the membership secretary for the past eight years has been an incredibly rewarding experience welcoming over the 300 new members, working with the Harbor Committee and the Board of Directors, and being on the Bylaws and Standing Rules Committee has been very enjoyable. I'm excited to continue building on the work that's been started, including forming a financial planning committee to ensure Fairwind's financial health. It's a big part of what I've got to talk about, and begin upgrading our fleet with newer and better boats. A volunteer recognition program is on the horizon to show appreciation for the members who generously contribute their time and skills to making Fairwind the fabulous community that it is. My focus will remain on safeguarding the club by making sure we obtain the necessary paperwork from outside contractors, ensuring Fairwind is named as the additional insured and managing all of the required agreements and waivers. Fairwind is a place that holds deep meaning, and there's a strong commitment to ensuring the club remains welcoming and inclusive and vibrant. The importance of diversity, volunteerism, and continuous improvements cannot be overstated, and these values will continue to be advocated for if elected. I want to thank all of you for your support over the years, for considering me for another term as membership secretary. It's been an honor to serve, and the opportunity to continue would be greatly appreciated. And I want to thank you for your time, your attention, and your trust. And any questions or thoughts are welcome anytime. Thank you. All right, that concludes our programming for tonight. Thank you, everybody, for your time. I appreciate all four of you candidates and the election committee as well. I know that it's no easy feat doing what you're doing and willingly signing up for it we you know appreciate appreciate that very much and we wouldn't be able to have all the great times on the boats without you guys doing that so thank you very much thank you for all the members and all the great questions and um i suppose at some point we'll get this uh recording disseminated to everybody and then we'll have ballots going out on midnight of the 11th i believe so uh the day after tomorrow that would be um, so be on the lookout for that, and everybody have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Hey, Mark, do you think I do? I just stop it, and that does the recording, or what do I do here? You're. Let me unmute you. Holy right. cow! Look, Mark Salkin. After you stop it, um, just stop it, it, it'll work. No, you need to select that it be decoded, yeah. otherwise, it's just gibberish. When I click stop, it'll ask me though. Yes, if you, yes, are you sure you want to stop recording to the cloud? Yes. <laughs>